I'm the mother on the program. <laughs> of course, I'm not the only mother, but I am speaking as a mother. You see, my 14-year-old daughter Elizabeth should be up here giving this talk, but she can't because she can't speak. So you'll be meeting her up here on the big screen. Elizabeth's inability to speak is a medical mystery that we've been trying to solve for the past decade. It's been a long and winding road. In fact, I think we've had appointments with half the clinicians in here, and some of you at NIH as well. It's been quite a journey of discovery, including Elizabeth discovering her voice in poetry. Me. I sometimes fear that people cannot understand that I hear, and I know they don't believe I go to every extreme to try to express my need to talk. If only they could walk in my shoes, they would share my news. I am in here and trying to speak every day in some kind of way. Now, Elizabeth wrote this poem when she was nine years old in response to a speech expert we had just seen for an evaluation. She was stumped by Elizabeth's inability to speak and said, maybe she just doesn't want to talk. I wanted to scream. Elizabeth was more eloquent with her poem. Now, you gonna come walk to mama? Elizabeth did have a beautiful voice. One that every, every mother would love. In fact, she lost it all at 15 months, not saying a word. Now, I won't try to explain to you the horror of seeing your child slip from you. I will just tell you that we crisscross the country seeing experts in many different fields. And, in fact, when I look now for people who are in tops of their fields and I try to get additional help, I consider it a gift if any professional says to me, I don't know. Because what I'm hearing is, I don't know yet. And that opens up the possibility for discovery because there's still so much that we don't know. But Elizabeth, she knows some things. She wrote this when she was 12, the things I know for sure. There is a God. I am loved. The sun will shine. I will survive autism. Yes, Elizabeth is profoundly affected by autism. This gem has become a mantra for me in the turmoil. It helps me to remember what's important. Elizabeth has had to fight images like this. You may know that the Greek word for autism comes from the word self, selfism. Once you slap that label on someone, the assumption is that they don't care about the outside world. And, you know, in fact, that's the farthest from the truth. But you see an image like that, and you think somebody's hitting themselves and unable to speak? Just how much can there be in there? When Elizabeth was two and a half, she was given an IQ test, and she scored extremely low. In fact, even after she learned to type, the most common assessment we received was low functioning. But I couldn't believe that because I remembered Elizabeth's sparkling eyes and her beautiful voice. 
And so we embarked upon an intensive educational program. We had therapists in our house day and night. It was a circus with a purpose. We made many advances for Elizabeth, but we still did not find a way for her to communicate to us what she was thinking and feeling. Until one day, when she was six years old, we finally found a woman in Austin, Texas, named Soma Mukupadaye. She taught Elizabeth how to point first on a letter board and then later on a computer and iPad using her rapid prompting method. You may not know, but many people with autism have trouble with simple physical acts, such as pointing. But her method has helped Elizabeth and thousands like her to find a way to communicate. Early in one of her sessions, she asked Elizabeth to spell a word that started with A. Elizabeth was six years old. I'm thinking, maybe apple. Instead, she typed A-G-O-N-Y. Agony. Soma says, do you know what that means? Elizabeth gave her a sideways glance and typed, quite so. <coughs> what is your agony? I need to talk. Well, tears filled my eyes. This is the first time that my daughter had expressed that same basic desire we all have, to talk, to connect. And it all came rushing back to me, all those conversations with friends and family, clergy, clinicians, therapists, all saying or implying that she was low functioning. They had this mental model that equated nonverbal with non-thinking. And my eyes were open as never before. And so, I petitioned the local public school to have Elizabeth skip kindergarten and enter first grade. You may say there was some skepticism there, <laughs> but I knew we had an exceptional educational aid and a loving first grade teacher and we would try to make it work. Now that first year, she was inconsistent. Sometimes she would type and sometimes she just wouldn't. But that teacher who described her as a hidden treasure, she did not question her capability. She said, I think she's bored. I agreed and we asked that she be considered for the gifted program. Now, I soon found out that that involved the dreaded IQ test. I had cried over that disastrous previous score more than I'd like to admit to you, and I had put it away. But I had to get over my fear because I knew that this was the only way to instantly raise expectations, and that if Elizabeth did well, the school would be willing to invest more in her. So the day came. We had it planned like a bank heist. <laughs> she was going to be asked questions until she got 10 wrong. On the first day, no wrong answers. What a relief. The second day, questions got harder. She was asked such things as, what is social security? To which she correctly responded, so old people have money. <laughs> By the third day, we were into high school questions. And they ran out before she got 10 wrong. teacher was thrilled to tell me that she had tested in the genius range. Now, after
after the test, I asked her, how did you know all these things? And she typed out, I am listening. <laughs> and do you know I have to constantly remind myself of that? She can be rocking and shaking, and she's not missing a thing. In fact, I think she thinks more deeply because of the silence. And I've come to call her my old soul. Consider this, she wrote, when she was 11. Your insides, a cry, a tear, a trail of fear, the pain inside too strong to hide, a sigh, oh my, why? Well, I tore myself up for months thinking that her autism was causing her such agony. And it was only after I was gathering 70 of her poems up for her book, I Am In Here, that I asked her about this poem. <laughs> and she typed out for me, my heart feels so sad for the children of Iraq who live in fear. So much for selfism. <laughs> in fact, Elizabeth dispels other myths of autism. We had a television reporter ask her, what do you hope for the future? To which she typed, cute boys. After the cameras were rolling, she typed, a cure for autism. <laughs> so, when we were preparing for our talk, I asked her what she wanted to say, and this is what she typed for you. On the dark side is the traditional belief that we have no language. Free your minds from disbelief. Free our minds from disbelief. Elizabeth is asking us to believe, to evolve our model for autism, to assume intelligence. She has taught me that just because a person can't speak, doesn't mean she can't hear, think, and feel. Her message, I am in here, speaks for all those with autism. The million hidden treasures. Elizabeth is optimistic, and so am I. She has the courage and faith to see a bright future. When you see a tree, think of me growing strong and tall. When you see the sun shining brightly, think of me tough and mighty. When you see the water on the lake, think of the future I plan to make. Me, strong, mighty, free. Ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce my daughter, Elizabeth?